sent the power up from Berkeley to we'll talk about the regularity and long-term solution for cross-ordinary transmissions. Thank you. Uh, so I see that this is, this is working. Uh, first of all, it's uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be speaking at this uh, meeting. So thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation. Uh, since uh, the audience here uh, has a very broad uh, background, I thought that I'd give a bit of an overview talk. Um, and the downside to this, obviously, is that some details will be missing. So feel free to, to ask me. Um, so this is a, a, a research program that I uh, have been pursuing recently, jointly with uh, um, Harry Eiting, whom uh, most of you have just known. Uh, and this is also a working part with uh, Albert I. Uh, Albert was uh, my, my graduate student, and now he is uh, uh, close to finishing his postdoc with uh, Mihaela and um, uh, Chris Fancer. Uh, now, if you look at the title of the talk, uh, it might seem that this is about two um, somewhat disjoint subjects, the question of low regularity or closeness for quasi-linear PD. The, the, Theme, one common theme is quasi-linear PD, so everything in this talk will be quasi-linear. Um, but we have these two, two different questions, one low regularity or closeness, and the other the uh, attempt to understand long-time solutions for this kind of problems. And one of the themes of my talk is that, in effect, these two problems are not so different, and that we have common uh, uh, ideas that have moved from one to the other uh, in one direction and then uh, in the other direction and I'll try to uh, point those uh, out for you. Uh, so uh, this work uh, sort of emerged from work on uh, uh, water waves that uh, um, I, I did with uh, Michaela a number of years ago uh, based on, on some very nice ideas that uh, she has about uh, the water waves, but this talk will not be about water waves. There will be one small portion about water waves. Uh, as you'll see, the um, ideas here apply in a much uh, broader context. So um, let me uh, begin with a little bit of uh, uh, an introduction. So uh, this looks a little bit like Jalal's first slide. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'll talk about nonlinear dispersive problems. And the way I wrote the equation over here, I separated the linear part on the left and the nonlinear part on the right. Um, um, for the linear part, uh, we have the standard stuff, we have the characteristic set, we have the group velocity of waves with the frequency psi, so psi stands for spatial frequency, tau stands for tau frequency. This is the dispersion relation, sometimes it's called. Um, and this model here, uh, the linear model is dispersive if the Hessian of A uh, is random degenerate in some way or another. Um, now, the nonlinearity, uh, since we're, we're talking here about complex solutions, we'll, we can think about it as a, a nonlinear function of the variable u, but really, uh, if you want to think about this uh, in terms of multilinear expansions, it would be a multilinear expansion in u and the complex conjugate of u. And the fact that the equations that we want to look at are quasi-linear means that uh, in this nonlinearity n, you might have terms which are as strong as the linear part A, or perhaps even stronger than the linear part A. So uh, don't get deceived by the fact that n is put on the right. Uh, this is just an expansion based on homogeneity uh, of terms rather than uh, the, the strength. And uh, one important uh, item uh, in my story would be about uh, resonant versus non-resonant interactions uh, in here. Um, and when we talk about uh, resonant or non-resonant interactions, there is a naive way to think about this, and the naive way is uh, resonant or non-resonant relative to this uh, linear flow. Uh, but really, the deeper way to think about it is in terms of resonant or non-resonant interactions relative to the linearized flow associated to not an arbitrary solution, not a, a, a fixed solution, but an arbitrary solution of this equation. So, uh, if you look at the linear A flow, this is as if you linearize around zero. But we don't care about linearization around zero. We care about linearization around an arbitrary solution. And so here I put some uh, examples of uh, dispersion relations. Some of this uh, will come uh, up in my talk. NLS, DVD, uh, half waves, uh, the gravity waves. Uh, and later I'll say more about wave equations and the gravity waves. So that's why but you see that there are lots of dispersion relations 
um, and uh, many of you have worked on uh, various problems uh, uh, inside. Um, on the other hand, if we look at the nonlinearity of the problem, so this is just to set up the terminology, uh, we can try to describe the nonlinearity uh, based on its uh, strength, and some of these problems we call them semi-linear, and some of these problems we call them uh, quasi-linear, and there is a, uh, a sort of a naive classification of what is semi-linear and what is quasi-linear, but my favorite way to distinguish between semi-linear and quasi-linear is in semi-linear problems you expect some sort of rigid dependence of solutions on the initial data, whereas in quasi-linear equations you expect to have just continuous dependence, and so based on this criteria, uh, the, uh, the same equation might even be semi-linear or quasi-linear, depending on uh, the space you're studying in. Uh, then another important distinction that will come up in my talk is between uh, having to do with homogeneity of the nonlinearity, uh, uh, starting with quadratic, uh, cubic, and this is really where the distinction stops. Uh, everything else is, is a higher order. Um, and finally, another distinction that will come up is distinction between defocusing problems and focusing problems. And this will primarily come up in the context of cubic nonlinearities. Of course, we can talk about defocusing nonlinearities or focusing also in higher order, but this will not um, uh, much appear. Yeah. And so these are the two questions that we uh, want to ask. Uh, we have our uh, quasi linear evolution equation in some sort of space. Well, we want to ask what, are, what is the range of Sobolev spaces where your problem is locally well posed. So, this is your locally well posed next question. And then uh, the question of uh, global well posedness, where uh, one way you could possibly phrase the problem is to start with general Dirichlet and Sobolev space. These two S's might be the same or might be different. And then you ask, do I have global dispersive solutions? What does global dispersive solutions mean? In a very restrictive sense, you might say that to mean that you have scattering. Scattering means that at infinity your solution looks like a linear wave, uh, a solution to the linear A uh, equation. Uh, but more generally, uh, you could uh, come up with a generalized meaning for uh, dispersive or for scattering uh, to mean that your solution satisfies maybe the same range of estimates that are satisfied by uh, the corresponding linear flow, but perhaps without actually having scattering, because in many situations uh, it's not possible to, to have scattering. So my battle plan, so to speak, is I'll give a brief introduction to each of these two problems, and then uh, I'll tell you about the kind of work that we've been doing for the first problem, and the kind of work that we have been doing for the second. Uh, and I'll begin with the quasi-linear local opposedness. This is a slide for um, say, uh, graduate students and postdocs. Um, what does quasi linear local opposedness mean? So I've studied it before. You want to have uh, existence of solutions, uniqueness of solutions, that's standard. Equally important, and going back to Hadamard, uh, the uh, question of uh, continuous dependence of solutions in, uh, so continuous dependence, uh, continu continuity of the data to solution map. Uh, and here I wrote this in a restrictive sense, often you can make this a little bit more, uh, more accurate. Uh, and coming back to enhanced, another common feature of many of the uh, uh, quasi-linear local process results that I will tell you about is this weak Lipschitz dependence. So we're trying to compare solutions. In particular, we're trying to look at linearizations. And for comparing solutions, you don't compare them in the strong topology that would give you Lipschitz dependence of the solution from the initial data. Instead, um, you compare them in a weaker topology. Here I put L2, but it doesn't have to be L2. And often you have to be very careful on how you choose this uh, uh, topology. And the last uh, bullet point in here, uh, you also care often about higher regularity. Uh, so uh, if your initial data is more regular, then the solution is more regular. And this uh, particularly is important because often when you construct solutions, you uh, sometimes construct directly graph solutions, but more often, you think of these rough solutions as the unique limits of smooth solutions, so then it's important to have those smooth solutions as a starting point. All right, so this, uh, so, so in terms of uh, local low potence, I'll tell you uh, an important question is what is the uh, Sobolev regularity S, where you look for solutions. And classically, uh, uh, we have a well understood mechanism to, to obtain solutions for quasi linear problems that sufficient regularity, and this goes to 
energy estimates, and these energy estimates you do them in two stages. You do energy estimates for a full equation, uh, and then you have to do also energy estimates for the linearized equation that uh, allows you to compare different solutions. Um, now, we would like to have this exponent s as small as possible, uh, so that's what low regularity law process means, and uh, um, one universal threshold given by scaling the exponent, uh, assuming that your equation has scaling, and even if your equation does not have scaling, perhaps it will have some leading order scaling that will tell you what, uh, 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 what is this universal threshold, and aspirationally, you want to bring your uh, local low quotient space as close as possible to the critical subordinate. And I'm using the word uh, uh, aspirationally because this, uh, as far as I know, this has not really been the case that uh, in quasi-linear problems, uh, local low quotient theory has gone down all the way to scaling, unless you're cheating, uh, unless your quasi-linear problem is secretly uh, obtained by transforming some simpler problem in a uh, nonlinear way. Okay, and one one of the uh, maybe the, the single most important thing that you need to understand when you look at uh, the so forth and results is you have to understand nonlinear wave, wave interactions. And of course, uh, important here is uh, the strength of the nonlinearity, but this is also captured by scaling in a way. Uh, but secondly, most important is. Uh, you want to understand resonant interactions versus non-resonant interactions. Many of you have already discussed in talks um, uh, and differentiated between resonant and uh, non-resonant uh, interactions. Um, and related to this, uh, uh, null conditions, so null conditions are connected with uh, resonant interactions. Um, and having a null condition means that, well, your dispersion relation might allow for resonant interactions, but the strength of the, uh, the resonant interactions is given by a symbol which perhaps vanishes, um, and that would be your uh, non condition. Uh, and finally, and uh, just as important, we're talking about dispersive equations. Everything today will be about dispersive equations in this talk. Um, and so um, we want to understand what role dispersion plays into this uh, in many ways, in terms of one way you would say linear dispersive decay, so strict cut estimates, another way via multilinear estimates. Um, and when we talk about multilinear estimates, we discriminate between uh, parallel and transversal interactions. So uh, maybe a picture that we should have uh, in mind is we could have uh, um, waves that uh, travel in the same direction. Um, like this and interact. And then you might perhaps, perhaps have waves that travel in different directions Interact. And these interactions have uh, play a very different role. Um, in the first case, um, these waves stay together for a long time and interact a lot, whereas when you have transversal uh, uh, interactions, uh, these waves meet and greet and uh, don't see each other again. All right, um, and another idea that will, will play a role um, is the idea of making good choices, uh, in particular, choosing uh, good variables for your quasi linear equation. Thomas already um, told us about uh, good variables in uh, a range of problems and then uh, a related uh, idea of choosing good quasi-linear energy. So you want to do perhaps energy estimates or what is a good energy to work with. So um, that much about uh, uh, local robustness and now I move on to a quick overview of local robustness and I'm doing something very classical. Um, so a classical way of getting global robustness is you have some conserved energy, uh, you have some local robustness at the same energy level, then you get global robustness. But of course, the downside to this is you don't have any uh, idea about the global behavior of solutions. You don't have any idea about uh, scattering behavior of solutions. Um, if you want to bring in uh, into picture scattering, um, you can try to combine this with the three cards estimates. And so if you can wave Sricard estimates into your global low process result, then not only you get global low process, but you also get scattering. The downside to this approach is that it works only if your nonlinearity has either high enough order or um, you're in high enough dimensions. These are, uh, so you essentially you match the order of the nonlinearity with dimension. For instance, if you consider nonlinear, quasi-linear wave equations, then you have to be at least in dimension four for this to work. 
uh, or if you consider uh, quasi-linear Schrodinger equations, you have to be at least in dimension three for this uh, to work. All right, and then uh, uh, another very popular uh, research topic in, uh, in uh, uh, recent years has been to say, well, uh, perhaps uh, um, one way to uh, uh, address this kind of problems in low dimensions especially uh, is uh, to uh, improve the uh, initial data and maybe start with the small, smooth and localized initial data. So the picture we have uh, in my head in mind in here is we start with the initial data, which looks like a bump function, and then ask what happens with this uh, bump function initial data. And what we expect in here is uh, a linear propagation, essentially. Uh, and if we have enough decay at infinity, you might get some scattering. Uh, but if not, perhaps you, can, you might get some modified scattering um, uh, as, a, as the outcome of this. And this is where uh, vector field methods have been uh, uh, widely used. Um, and uh, as I was telling you before, particularly in one dimensional problems, you never expect to get scattering, but you expect to get some modified scattering. And so this is what my talk will not be about. Um, all right, so instead, uh, uh, in the work that I want to tell you about, um, uh, we take this as a starting point and we start crossing things out. So we don't want it, our initial data to be smooth and we don't, our, we don't want our initial data to be localized. And then we still want to ask the question, can we get global well-posedness for our problem and can we get dispersive decay? Um, and so um, the primary problem that we'll look at in here will be a qubit problem. Uh, and in the case of a qubit problem, uh, we want to discriminate, we'll have to discriminate between focusing problems and defocusing problems. So this is in the quasi-linear context. Perhaps you haven't seen so much about focusing versus defocusing in the quasi-linear broad case, but this is where it, it really comes into, into play. On the other hand, not having a localization at the level of the initial data completely takes vector fields, uh, uh, vector field methods out of play. So there will be nothing about vector field methods. Um, and then this uh, weaker notion of scattering that I'm mentioning about. You cannot expect any kind of scattering, but perhaps you can expect your solutions to satisfy some sort of um, uh, dispersive estimates uh, similar to the ones that are satisfied by the corresponding uh, linear methods. All right, and so one common feature between these two uh, problems, uh, uh, which will be present throughout the talk, will be uh, Bonnie's uh, formalist for the equation. So um, if you're not very familiar with this, you start with a, a nonlinear equation. So n is a generic nonlinearity in here. Uh, for this, you can write the corresponding linearized equation, which we all know is important in the study of uh, nonlinear PDEs. Um, and then to this, we associate always the uh, what's called the linear paradifferential equation, where we interpret uh, this uh, uh, component of the linearization uh, in, a, in the paradifferential way. And so here we think of W as high frequency waves evolving on a low frequency background, depending on, on your solution. Okay, uh, and once we have this uh, linear paradifferential equation, which we can also think of independently of uh, uh, the nonlinear equation, we can express the full equation uh, in a paradifferential formulation, uh, and then we can also express the linearized equation in a paradifferential formulation. Uh, now, this notation that I use in here is a little bit generic. There are some choices to be made in here. I'm not going to get into that, um, but uh, those uh, those choices are. Uh, important. Uh, one, uh, one key point in here, and this is again to be taken with a grain of salt, is that um, one way we want to think about this problem is the left-hand side as a linear uh, equation evolving on a variable coefficient background, and this variable coefficient background depends on your uh, solution u. And then the right-hand side uh, we want to think of as perturbative, so we'll take this for now as the gospel and then we'll uh, throw it away uh, at some point. And uh, uh, then uh, the similar thing happens for the uh, linearized equation. And in some sense, many of the difficulties that uh, uh, arise uh, in this problem stem from the linearized equation because always when you uh, uh, 
expand your original equation and the power differential equation might have more symmetry, whereas when we linearize, we lose some of that symmetry. So um, that much about that. Um, and now uh, let's uh, turn our attention to the local or post mass question, where the story, as of many years ago, um, had uh, two components. Uh, uh, so we begin with Cato, uh, who wrote some of the first uh, uh, works on, uh, on classical linear world positiveness. Uh, uh, and there, world positiveness was obtained via energy estimates. So uh, an energy estimate would be something that is formed. You have some energy at the so-called regularity S, and you try to control the growth of this energy uh, using uh, this B, which we is uh, what we call a control parameter uh, times the energy. So this, of course, allows you to use some ground model, provided that you have control over this B. And now this uh, uh, some some comments in here. So this ESW uh, will usually not be a standard Sobolev norm because we're looking at quasi-linear equations. So this is what uh, you have to construct in general. It's uh, what we call a quasi-linear energy. And this control parameter just for the purpose of getting well positiveness, you might say, oh, I, it should be enough to take this to be the HS norm of the solution. But uh, the better way to think about it is uh, uh, to, to try to uh, factor into be the amplitude of, uh, of waves. Uh, so uh, using standard an infinity type norm, uh, a uniform uh, control parameter in here. And the control parameters that I'll show you uh, will all be uh, uh, uniform control parameters. And so this is an energy estimate for the full equation. And then you can also write uh, similar energy estimates for the linearized equation in R2 or in R2 topology. Okay, so this is one, uh, uh, this is the first uh, bullet if you want. The second bullet is, uh, well, uh, uh, maybe uh, if you want to go down in regularity, it's better if you don't try to brutally estimate B uniformly in time, but instead gain some time integrability, and this would be the R3 pass estimate. Here, this exponent P, which is greater than or equal to two in general, depends on the dimension. In dimension uh, three and higher, you might hope for P uh, to be something like two, uh, but maybe a low dimension of P might be four. Um, and so, as I said, this allows you to control uh, this uh, control parameter P. Uh, and uh, when you do this analysis for the Sweetheart's estimates, um, you come back to this formalist and you prove your Sweetheart's estimates for the para differential equation rather than for the whole equation, and then try to think of the source terms in here as perturbative source terms. Now, the difficulty when you try to think of street cards estimates, which I'm sure all of you are well familiar with, is that you're trying to establish street cards estimates for an equation um, uh, like this one, which has variable coefficients. Not only it has variable coefficients, these variable coefficients have very low regularity. Uh, a very low regularity usually below what you might consider acceptable for classical methods. Okay, and then uh, <coughs> bullet number three, you want to combine these two in some careful uh, bootstrap uh, argument. And a neat way to do this is using uh, uh, Tao's uh, idea of uh, a notion of frequency envelopes. And if you want to see exactly how this is uh, uh, implemented in uh, uh, quasi linear uh, well positiveness, uh, you might look uh, at uh, uh, a sort of a primer paper that uh, we wrote together with uh, Mihaila. Uh, two, two years ago after uh, summer school, um, and our students found it uh, uh, very useful. Okay, so um, these are the key ideas, and now let me expand on, on this. So let's uh, uh, begin with the street arts estimates, um, and uh, just, um, so your street arts estimate would look like uh, you have some solution mu for your linear equation, measure it in some street art space, uh, this is P, this is X, it's more the initial data maybe in L2 um, or in some Sobolev space. And um, uh, the easiest uh, context you can look at this is if you have constant coefficients and then you have stationary phase uh, methods at your disposal. So this was work that was done in the 70s and 80s and uh, early 90s. Um, then uh, um, the sort of uh, if you go to uh, variable coefficients and you try to optimize a little bit the regularity of the coefficients, 
um, we find out immediately that the correct regularity threshold is to have C2 coefficients. Um, and uh, the place where C2 comes from is that you want to have a bi lipschitz hamilton flow. Um, and then you can produce weight packet color matrices. Um, so weight packets play a big role in my story. Um, and uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with this, weight packets are localized positions with the wave equations, so they're localized uh, uh, in position, and they travel along the rays of the Hamilton flow, so they're localized both in position and uh, in frequency, and the point here is to try to think of a general solution for uh, your uh, linear flow as a superposition of this kind of wave packet, which travel in different directions. Um, and then another approach has been to oscillatory integral kind of power matrices for your, your linear flow. Uh, but of course, C2 coefficients is way too high for quasi linear problems for local low positiveness. So, where do we go next? Uh, and, and the next idea that came up uh, is the idea of having strict arts estimates for, with low regularity in the coefficient and with lots of derivatives. Um, and this idea came up in uh, work that uh, uh, independently I did and Bali and Shimon did. And this was around uh, uh, 98, 99. Um, and so here for each frequency, you have a semi-classical time scale, uh, uh, which depends on this frequency at which you have strict arts without losses. And then you try to add up this bound and you get strict arts uh, uh, with losses. And uh, finally, uh, there's the idea of having strict arts estimates without loss of derivatives. So you might say, well, this might require C2 coefficients. But you don't have C2 coefficients at your disposal, so you, you need a new idea. Uh, and uh, this new idea came, came up from, uh, from work of uh, Kleinerman, who um, observed that sometimes it's, uh, so this is a sort of a broad uh, uh, observation, that you might be able to use the fact that the coefficients uh, in turn solve an equation. And so of course implementing this uh, idea is very different in different equations. Uh, and it came up in nonlinear wave equations in work that I did with spin. Um, it came up in work that uh, Albert uh, did uh, um, uh, in, on uh, gravity waves. Uh, and then uh, very recently uh, in work that I did with, uh, together with Mihaila uh, on uh, 1D uh, quasi linear Schrodinger equations. And I'll tell you more about that. So if you think about uh, uh, the first uh, component somehow of uh, uh, well, if you think about the, so I told you a little bit about three class estimates. Now we move on, on to energy estimates. Um, um, the energy estimates, uh, the kind of energy estimates that Pato proved and other, lots of other people, uh, including people in, in the audience uh, um, early on, are what we call quadratic energy estimates in the sense that your control parameter depends uh, linearly on your solution. Um, so B, you think of B as some norm of U. But if you think of long time solutions for your uh, uh, PDs, then it's more uh, efficient to have cubic energy estimates. Um, and these are particularly interesting for problems where you have quadratic nonlinearities. Um, and they're uh, achievable uh, for problems where you have uh, a null structure as well. Uh, so a cubic energy estimate uh, looks like this. The reason I put this index three is to differentiate this energy here from the energy here. They're not the same energies. You have to nicely construct this quasi-linear, we call this cubic quasi-linear energies. Uh, and so uh, the point here is that now you have two control parameters here, A and B. Um, one is uh, at low regularity. Uh, B is the same guy perhaps that we had before at higher regularity. Um, and uh, ideally, A uh, is a, a scale invariant control parameter, B is above scaling, and also ideally, this estimate should be scale invariant. So we, uh, scaling sits always in, in the background in our analysis. And so this uh, uh, cubic uh, energy estimates emerge um, from uh, what we call modified energy methods, which we developed for with uh, Mihail and also with uh, John Hunter, uh, about 10 years ago. Um, so the, the situation at the time was that one could do uh, cubic estimates but lose derivatives in those cubic estimates, or one could do quasi-linear estimates which are quadratic, and then the question was to put one and two together. 
um, and this is what uh, we are able to achieve uh, on another on a number of examples, uh, particularly in waterways, um, and so that uh, opened the way for for a lot of uh, other problems. And one way you can think about this is uh, as a way to um, uh, adapt uh, Joao's uh, normal form uh, method um, in the quasi-linear setting. Uh, the uh, normal form method has a big failing in the quasi-linear setting, which is that it gives you unbounded normal form transformations. And one way you can rectify this is instead of transforming the equation, you transform your energy. All right? um, and so, this, uh, so, so we have this, uh, uh, in a number of situations, this cubic energy estimates. Um, another way, by the way, of producing these cubic energy estimates is using the paradiagonalization method of Alazar and Galor. Um, and uh, this will play uh, a role also in my story uh, later on. Uh, but the problem with these cubic energy estimates uh, in terms of local low is this is good for long time bonds, but perhaps it doesn't give you so much extra information for local low potents because you still have to control the higher regularity term, the B. Okay? Um, and then the uh, uh, idea that uh, emerged from, from this, um, and that happened uh, a few years ago, is that uh, when you have quadratic nonlinearities and the non structure, sometimes you might be able to produce a new class of energy estimates, um, uh, which we call the balanced uh, cubic energy estimates. So this is what's here. And you can compare this energy estimate with the ones that I copy pasted from the previous slide in here. So here you have two control parameters, A and B. They are a different regularity. And what you might try to do is you might try to balance the regularity of A and B into this <coughs> leverage this into this A one half, which is that the middle regularity between what you had for A and what you had for B. So here A was at scaling, B was above scaling, but a little bit more. Here, this A one half is halfway closer to the scaling. And if you could do this, this does not uh, improve your, it improves a little bit your long time of closeness results, but this really will help you uh, with, a, a long, uh, with a local uh, well closeness at, at low regularity. Um, and, um, so, uh, as I said before, this was uh, this happened a couple of years ago, and the first place, the first uh, place where we observed that we could do something like this was in work that uh, uh, Mihal, uh, that Albert and Mihal and myself did for two-dimensional gravity waves, um, and then more recently for the hyperbolic minimal surface equations uh, that was about uh, two years ago. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about cubic gravity waves, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, this uh, minimal surface uh, equation. So let's begin with gravity waves. Um, uh, and here I'll start uh, a little bit abruptly. Uh, Thomas uh, uh, nicely explained to us how gravity waves uh, can be put into the Zakharov form uh, and reduced to uh, an evolution on the surface and on the, on the free surface of the picture that we, that we have in mind here. And then we use blue for water. Um, so you have some water, you have air, and you have a free surface in between. And you're tracking two things. You're tracking, number one, the free surface, and then you're tracking the velocity potential on the free surface. And so um, what's different in here compared to what you saw in Tomasi's talk is the choice of gauge, the choice of coordinates. Uh, so here we use uh, uh, polymorphic or conformal coordinates. Um, you have two variables, one this W that describes the surface parametrization, another one that describes this velocity potential on top. This is not a classical velocity potential, it's some complex velocity potential. And a priori you can um, uh, think of the choice of coordinates as, as a gauge freedom uh, in here. And in, in this uh, polymorphic coordinates, uh, this is um, similar to Eno's talk. You have an evolution, uh, which you see below, uh, and this evolution happens, uh, uh, sorry, I know this is for functions with negative frequencies, not with positive frequencies, that's what came out. Uh, but in any case, so you have this uh, space, so sobolev space is a function which have only negative frequencies. Uh, it's more convenient to look at equations for differentiated variables, in which case you're measuring the slope and some complex version of the velocity, and you end up with a quasi-linear equation, 
where you have a comp where you have a transport term, which you can think about this as some sort of material derivative, and then you have a coupling term between those two equations. In this first equation, you have one derivative, here you have none, and that causes an unbalanced interval regularity between these variables w, w, and r. You also have this uh, incidentally the stable coefficient, which is positive, uh, in order to have uh, low positiveness. Um, and so uh, this is the equation from the previous slides. I tell you there is an unbalanced irregularity between uh, W and R. So uh, yeah. you put W in HS, R velocity has to be in HS plus one half. And if you look at the scaling, this formula has a nice scaling, especially if you are in deep water. Uh, you have a critical subvolate scaling, and then you have uh, uh, this equal to one half. Uh, and uh, uh, to make a long story short, the result that we have without Dr. Mihaela says that uh, the two dimensional gravity waves flow is locally well posed at one quarter derivative above this critical Schomburg index. Um, and for comparison, you can see uh, in, on the slide uh, how the results of this uh, uh, evolve, beginning with uh, CJ Wu, uh, with the work of Zad Yu and Ji Li, uh, for which we were able to get an epsilon improvement uh, using this uh, uh, cubic energy estimates, and then um, they brought in the uh, three cuts estimates with the loss uh, to gain a little bit more. Um, this is just in two dimensions. Um, and then uh, Albert had his sharp uh, three cuts uh, uh, estimates come into play for a more substantial improvement. And you see that just using balanced cubic energy uh, gets you a better result than using sharp three cuts. Uh, which is interesting. Um, and what we're working on now, but we still have some little issues to iron out, uh, is to combine uh, Albert's uh, uh, sharp Sikats estimates uh, with our balanced cubic energy estimates and get, uh, uh, get a nice result, uh, uh, perhaps 1A, but you see a question mark over here. Um, part of the difficulty is that Albert's uh, energy estimates are uh, using Thomas's formulation of the equation, so it's a Haro formulation. Whereas our um, energy estimates are using the holomorphic uh, coordinates. So that much about uh, water waves. Um, and the second equation that I wanted to show you is the hyperbolic minimum surface equation. So um, uh, we heard a little bit earlier yesterday about uh, minimum surfaces. This is the hyperbolic version of the equation. Uh, you try to minimize uh, the area of a surface um, in, in, in the Minkowski space side. You have very ugly Euler Lagrange equations, but a much cleaner geometric equation if you use the metric restricted, uh, the Minkowski metric restricted to your surface sigma. And as you see on this uh, bottom slide, this equation is known in many fields of uh, mathematics by many names. And it took us a while to figure out all of this and figure out how many people have worked on this problem. Um, as a starting point for our work, uh, there's uh, this. Uh, um, theorem that I proved with uh, Smith in 2001, um, um, which gives us uh, a threshold of one half about scaling for local low closeness for generic nonlinear wave equations, slightly different numerology in two dimensions. Um, and this result generically is sharp by uh, the counterexample of uh, Hans Lindblad. Um, so, in some sense, this was the end of the story. But uh, the next question, the next central question to ask was, well, can you improve this uh, result for special equations? And special equations means equations for, for which satisfy a null condition, and the conjecture from about the same time said, well, perhaps we should be able to improve local closeness if we have a nonlinear null condition. So let me emphasize here the word nonlinear. Uh, maybe many of you have uh, seen the classical uh, linear null condition. Uh, the nonlinear null condition, the difference between linear and the nonlinear null condition is for the linear null condition, you're looking at the null condition around the zero solution. For the nonlinear null condition, uh, uh, you're looking at uh, uh, this, uh, the same kind of pattern, but along, along an arbitrary solution to your nonlinear equation. So, in other words, not every equation which satisfies the linear null condition also will satisfy the nonlinear null condition. Okay, um, so um, so this this conjecture has probably remained fully open for about uh, twenty years now, um, and the result we were able to get together with Albert and Mihaela was to to 
prove this conjecture uh, in this case of the minimum surface equation, not only were we able to prove it, but to gain, uh, to, to make a substantial gain. So, uh, for instance, in dimensions three, uh, uh, we went from one half to one quarter, so halfway to scaling. We also have the equal sign in here, allowed, uh, which was not allowed before uh, for uh, generic uh, problems. Um, and the improvement is even larger in, in uh, two dimensions. Um, and the only earlier results uh, that went in this direction were simply uh, epsilon removal results for Einstein equations by Kleinman, Levian, Levianski, etc. Uh, and for this minimal surface equation by uh, Boris Sekimer. Okay, so um, again, a slide which uh, tells you the progression of results here. We start from Hughes, Scott, and Marcel. Uh, which is the classical result and uh, uh, sequence of improvements uh, uh, by Bowie and Schumann and, and myself, um, and coming back to coming down to this uh, final result that I'm telling you about today. Uh, and so uh, the key step uh, in, in this analysis is to look at balanced energy estimates. Uh, and these balanced energy estimates are proved in several stages. First, they are proved for the parallel differential equation. Uh, uh, First in L2 using modified energies. And this uh, these two words in here, modified energies, um, they look simple, and you might think, oh, you just choose the right energy and it works. Well, we wish it were like this. It's not. This modified energies, uh, these words mean like 40 pages of mathematics, uh, um, and um, these energies have to be painfully uh, constructed uh, using the null structure of the problem rather than easily guessing what they are. You cannot guess what they are. No chance at all. Um, and they're not algebraic, um, and uh, this is a complicated process which is sort of reminiscent of the renormalization for wave maps for those of you who are um, familiar with them. Okay, uh, then uh, from this balanced energy bound for the power differential equations in L2, we go to H sigma, and this is what we call a power conjugation argument, where you have to look at the size of frequencies as you move along by characteristics. Um, then we go to balance energy bounds for the full equation. This is sort of the easier step um, in all solar spaces. So you don't have to be exactly in the S where you prove your local low positives. You can be in any positive uh, H sigma. Um, and then uh, balance energy bounds for the linearized equation where you have to very carefully choose your sigma naught in here. So our sigma naught is maybe one half in dimension uh, three and higher. And don't ask me why, five over eight uh, in dimension uh, two, um, and that's because of this loss of symmetry that happens in the linearization. Finally, one has to convert this small data lossless three cuts estimates in my work with Smith into a large data three cuts estimate with losses. This is again uh, substantial work, and the difficulty here has to do with uh, the fact that you want to use scaling, but you're working in inhomogeneous solar spaces. And finally, on top of this, you have to put a big bootstrap argument. Uh, and this is perhaps one of the most complicated bootstrap arguments uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have ever used. Uh, but uh, in the end it works, and part of the problem is you cannot do your bootstrap for a single solution. You have to do your bootstrap for a family of regularized solutions to your equation. So you take your initial data, you have a family of regularizations for it, and then you solve the equations for each of those regularizations, and you have a bootstrap for all of those solutions all at once. Long story, made very short. All right, so we switch over to the second topic, which is uh, uh, global well-hostedness. And uh, so what I want to briefly motivate at first is the kind of problems that we're looking at. So I was telling you that when you look at global problems, lower dimension is harder, and lower nonlinearity, lower homogeneity for the nonlinearity is also harder. And that's why here you see 1D problems with cubic nonlinearity. The only thing that could be worse than this is one of the problems with quadratic nonlinearities. We're not there. Uh, so for today, uh, one of the problems uh, with cubic nonlinearity. And here, we have two very nice conjectures for you. Um, they're pretty hot. Uh, we came up with these conjectures maybe a, a few years ago, but we only uh, published this last year. Um, um, and these conjectures are very simple and very general. So. Uh, this global opposedness conjecture tells you that you have global dispersive opposedness. If you have a one-dimensional dispersive problem 
which is what we call conservative and defocusing. So the key word in here is defocusing. Focusing versus defocusing plays a huge role in one dimension because the moment you give up the localization of the initial data, focusing problems will have solitons. And so uh, if you want to uh, avoid solitons, uh, you have to look at problems which are defocused. So very simple uh, conjecture uh, should apply equally for semi-linear problems or quasi-linear problems. Um, and as far as we know, there was no uh, inkling that uh, such a thing might be, might be possible before that. Um, and once you see this conjecture, you might say, oh, but what happens for focusing problems? Well, we have a matching conjecture for focusing problems. Uh, so here you see our conjecture. So now you start with initial data, you measure the size of the data, epsilon. Here we didn't have an epsilon because we just have to have a small enough initial data. Here you have initial data size, S, size epsilon. And you ask, how long can I track the solutions? Um, and uh, uh, we did some heuristics and we came up with this epsilon to the power minus 8, which we believe is the sharp time scale on which you can generically get solutions. Generically is the key word because, of course, you'll have problems where you have global solutions like integral of problems. All right, so, so we have these two conjectures. Um, and uh, uh, well, the reason we did not uh, um, put these conjectures out uh, sooner is because we tried to have a proof of concept result. Um, and one thing that, uh, um, uh, well, I don't have a lot of time, so let me go to, um, uh, go to the discussion of the results. So a key role in here is played by trilinear wave packet interactions, resonant interactions. Uh, Jalal and Jigala talked about that. Um, one one uh, key feature here is that you want to have a phase rotation uh, symmetry. And if you have a phase rotation symmetry, you can take this cubic expansion of the equation, where in the C, you put the cubic interactions, and all you care about here is interactions where we have equal frequencies. So this is as if you have one of this wave packet interacting with itself three times. And if you let this wave packet interact with itself three times, and you think of A as the amplitude, then you would get heuristically an equation for this amplitude. And in this equation, uh, what appears is the symbol of this uh, form C. Um, and uh, um, if you want to have global solutions for this, this uh, C has to be real. Uh, and this is our conservative assumption. And then the focusing versus defocusing assumption are given by the sign of C. All right. Uh, and so our first result uh, is a result for a semi-linear uh, Schrodinger type problem. And this essentially proves the conjecture. And I'll point out to you uh, what are the estimates that the solution satisfy. They satisfy energy estimates. They satisfy street cuts estimates. And then they satisfy bilinear L2 estimates. So the picture that you should have in mind here in terms of the dispersion relation is a uh, Schrodinger equation due to a parabola. Suppose we have one set here A uh, of frequencies, another set here B frequencies. Solutions here travel in one direction, solutions here travel in a different direction. And then you can estimate bilinearly the product of solutions um, in terms of the difference between the group velocities of the two corresponding solutions. Uh, and so this was the first uh, sort of proof of concept result for the uh, defocusing conjecture. Um, and this uh, wanted to point out to you that this gives uh, a new result even for the cubic NLS problem. So it gives you a universal bound, for instance, where you can estimate the solution in L6 in terms of the initial data in L2 and correspondingly a bilinear uh, to bound, and this improves something that has been done before by Planchon and Vega at high regularity. Um, and this is the matching uh, semi linear result for the focusing case. And now we go to a quasi linear problem. So this is a, a very new stuff. Uh, the result is maybe about 10 days uh, old. Um, two, two equations, but let's focus on this uh, first one. We have a metric here that depends on the unknown function u. So we take g to be quadratic and n to be cubic. Um, and here's our result. Uh, and here, you'll see local work constants. So one of the things we realized when we started looking at global solutions for this problem is, and that came as a complete surprise, is that these ideas that we have about how we approach this problem allow us actually to improve also the local world theory. And not only that we can improve the local world theory, we 
can improve it in the sharp way. So we we're able to get in one dimension the sharp local robustness result for this problem. So uh, here the threshold is s greater than one. The scaling is at one half, uh, and there's a good reason why uh, s less than one should yield uh, yield post uh, problems. Uh, and then we have the same kind of bounds: uniform energy bounds, three cuts estimate without the loss. That's uh, uh, what I was mentioning earlier, and then this transversal bilinear L2 bounds. Okay, um, and now the global result. So before, uh, for this local result, we had S greater than 1. Well, the global result is exactly at the same regularity. So we don't need to spend derivatives to get global solutions. At this sharp regularity, we also get global solutions, again satisfying the uniform energy bounds, Sweet estimates this time with the loss, but this transversal bilinear bounds without the loss. So this is the first proof of our conjecture in a uh, quasi-linear setting. Okay, uh, this is not the only quasi-linear problem to which this conjecture applies. It's just the first uh, example where we were able to uh, to prove uh, the conjecture, uh, and here we have the corresponding the matching. Um, uh, Focusing result with the epsilon to the power minus h times scale again for s greater than one. Um, and uh, following uh, Jalal's idea, this is my backup slide. Um, so um, there's more, lots more, but uh, I'll, I'll stop here. So these are the key ideas uh, in the proof of this uh, global results. Um, one thing that I mentioned before is frequency envelopes, and there's a complex bootstrap argument based on frequency. Frequency and loss. Uh, but the key ideas really here are to look at energy estimates via density flux identities. An idea which is kind of fairly old, comes from conservation laws, but uh, the implementation here is new uh, using uh, uh, lots of translation invariant multilinear forms. Uh, then uh, energies are, uh, standard energies are not good enough, so you have to use modified energies, a bit like the I matter, uh, but more uh, frequency localized. Um, and furthermore, we do we work with these modified energies, not as energies, but again as density flux identities. And then for these density flux identities, we hit them with the uh, interaction more of its bounds of the I team, um, and maybe a little bit closer to the function beta formulation in the one dimensional setting. And the last item in here is the three cuts estimates, where um, we have to use weight packet parametrices. Uh, the, the, the key word is, is this red perturbative, um, so you should think of this, this is for some meaning of perturbative, and this meaning is very complex indeed. Um, so, um, uh, so these are the, the, the ideas that allow us to prove this uh, uh, global estimates, and maybe one thing that I should mention is uh, when we prove this HS bounds, and the three cuts estimates and this transversal bilinear L2 bounds, we don't prove this as large. We prove this for frequency localized pieces of the solution. And then uh, it's very easy to put those together. It would be much harder to take them apart. So everything, all the analysis happens in a very frequency localized setting using the Bonnie's power differential formulas. Okay, and uh, quickly <laughs> at the end, thank you. <laughs>
now we're on the, it's a Hamiltonian system, and we look at uh, the Hamiltonian is a polar interaction with derivative to fractional power of u. What would prevent you from looking at that and, and doing the same time? Is there something conceptual about the just the last Schrodinger or? Well, uh, the, the reason we worked on uh, Schrodinger uh, to this point um, is uh, because uh, the reason we started with Schrodinger is because of the Galilean invariance. Um, and in our first paper, in the Samadinian paper, um, we used uh, uh, a lot uh, the Galilean invariance as simply a, as a way to um, uh, think of uh, the estimates as being invariant with respect to translation and frequency. Um, in the twice linear paper, we took completely out of the picture the Galilean invariance that doesn't exist there. Um, and so uh, in work that we're doing right now, we're looking exactly at the kind of models that you, you asked about. So there, there's no obstruction. The, the conjecture applies to them. Uh, certainly, there's uh, technical difficulties uh, in setting up the argument, but uh, we don't think that uh, uh, that's a real problem. So what kind of blow up, blow up do you think happens at the, the time scale epsilon to the power minus six? Um, what we think might happen there is a little bit similar to Almanac's results on uh, nonlinear wave equations, where you start with initial data up to uh, size epsilon, and you look for, for doubling time, or uh, you know, time where, where the solution grows 10 times what it was initially. So uh, this time should be epsilon to the power minus eight. Uh, well, of course, it's always the case that actually proving blow up is a much harder question. But like in a, in a Dawkins space, like like the derivative grow or the absolute grow? Or? No, the actual size of the solution. Okay. Uh, maybe I have a question as well, so uh, which interests me. Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, another problem for quasi linear uh, equations is also to get like the stability results for solitary waves. I mean, typically you can prove. Uh, Sort of um, conditional stability results. Uh, is there any hope that these methods? Well, um, one can try. Uh, we haven't looked at that uh, um, for uh, for technical reasons. Let's say um, you do expect the problem to get uh, more complicated. Um, and one thing that we have learned from work of, of uh, many people, uh, including perhaps. Uh, Delort and Maspati, and then work. Uh, uh, I think you did some work, Wilhelm, on this together with, uh, with, with Jonas Luhrmann. Uh, is that uh, when you have this kind of uh, problem, you might produce uh, sort of auxiliary waves uh, uh, which uh, make it harder to uh, understand the long time dynamics. There are no further questions, that's fine.